Welcome to our lecture on Blue Ocean Strategy. A long-standing belief in the strategy literature is that there are two ways you can beat out the competition. One is a focus on achieving low cost, while the second is a focus on differentiation, or creating a product or service that's uniquely different from the competition. This approach to strategy was brought into the forefront by renowned strategic thinker and Harvard professor Michael Porter in the early 80s, and it dominated corporate strategic thinking throughout the turn of the century. Then, in 2005, two professors from the INSEAD Institute in France published a book called Blue Ocean Strategy that challenged the notion that we have to make a choice. Instead of focusing on just one way to beat out the current competition, what if we focus on increasing value to the customer by improving both cost and differentiation? And what if we decided to focus on untapped markets instead of just the one we've been killing ourselves to dominate? Instead of a bloody battle with a competition, think Red Ocean Strategy, aka Competitive Advantage, where our focus is all about competing relentlessly over market share, what if instead we created blue oceans by finding uncontested market spaces that are waiting for innovation and value creation? As we see here, Red Ocean Strategy competes in an, in an existing market space and strives to beat the competition, whereas Blue Ocean creates an uncontested market space, making the competition completely irrelevant. Red Ocean focuses on exploiting existing demand to make the value cost trade-off, but Blue Ocean creates and captures new demand and breaks that trade-off. Overall, a Red Ocean strategy aligns the whole system of a firm's activity with its strategic choice of either differentiation or low cost. Blue Ocean strategy instead aligns the whole system of a firm's activities in pursuit of a differentiation and low cost strategy. People read the book Blue Ocean Strategy and they had an epiphany. This is exactly what our organization needs. We want to create new markets, increase demand, and we are tired of competing relentlessly for existing market share. But excitement alone can't make this happen. We need to create time and space for teams to think creatively about what customers need and want and how that aligns with the organization's purpose and vision. Another study that was done at the INSEAD Institute found that on average, 40% of a CEO's time is spent focusing on external rather than internal issues. For example, understanding the implications of a new technology versus debating cost allocations and overhead. Typically, leaders at all levels get consumed with day-to-day -day operational issues and focus inward. About 30% of the time looking outward was spent focused on long-term strategic opportunities, as opposed to just worrying about winning the next big customer, competitors, or funding opportunities. And then only about 20% of that time was dedicated to creating a cohesive vision of the future that was shared with the organization. We might think about this as being our positive business outlook or a shared vision of the future. Unfortunately, when we do the math, less than 3% of leadership's time is truly allocated to building a distinctive strategic view of the future, such as identifying a blue ocean strategy for the organization. So think about this for your organization. How often do you hear directly from senior leadership about both the short-term and long-term direction of the organization? Do you have clarity on when it, where an untapped market may exist? Is it clear what your role is gonna be in helping achieve that long-term vision for the organization? You might be thinking, nah, not really, or I don't think so, but I don't know that I'd be involved in those discussions. I hear that so often and try to reinforce that regardless of your place in the organization, you should have a good handle on the mission, values, and long-term vision for the organization. It's your leader's role. And depending on your position in the organization, it might be your role too. Creating this cohesive vision for the future is critical, and review sites like Glassdoor have started to ask employees to rate their employers on this positive business outlook. The Glassdoor survey asks employees, do you believe your company's business outlook will get better, stay the same, or get worse in the next six months? Unfortunately, these scores are often lower than other organizational aspects included in the sur survey. Go to glassdoor.com and see how your organization fares. As we can see here, 79% of respondents had a positive business outlook for this business. We still have a long way to go to get ourselves out of the old way of thinking to truly become creative, value-producing organizations with a clearly defined and communicated plan for the future. Now that you know all this, you can be the change, but let's talk a little bit more about how to create that clearly defined vision for the future. The authors of Blue Ocean Strategy identify three tiers of what we call non-customers. The first is soon to be non-customers who are on the brink of your existing market space. 
Just think about how many products or services you buy because you have to, not because you want to. So this could be paper towels, health insurance, mayonnaise. And if you were given a better alternative, you would go for it. Do you know your first tier non-customer pain points and frustrations? If not, you should. The second non-customers are what we call refusing non-customers who make a conscious choice not to be in your market. This may be a coffee lover that refuses to use K-cups because of the environmental impact. They want high quality coffee, quickly accessible, but refuse the, to use the single use plastic on a daily basis. These second tier non-customers have a ton of insight because they've actually thoughtfully considered your offering and decided against it. You just need to know why and see it as a potential opportunity. The third are unexplored non-customers who are markets distant from yours. In staying with a Keurig example, these could be individuals that just don't drink coffee. But don't stop there. Really try to understand these non-customers. Who are they? This is where we really need to shake off our predefined notions of our potential customers. If you have an image right now, as I'm walking through this example, of an adult coffee or tea drinker in your head, work to take off the blinders, right? Could these third tier non-customers be children or could they be corporations? This is where we need the creativity of the entire team and we need the voice of the non-customer. By looking to non-customers and focusing on their key commonalities and not differences, you can aggregate new demand and offer current customers and non-customers a huge leap in value. For decades, we focused so heavily on the voice of the customer that we haven't taken nearly as much time to listen to the voice of the non-customer. By focusing on the non-customer, companies can create value innovation, again, not just for non-customers, but your existing customers as well. You're like, okay, okay, we get it. Sounds great, but where do we start? In a follow-up to their original book, the authors published Blue Ocean Shift in 2017 to help bring more clarity in how we can truly make the shift from red oceans to blue oceans. Before we dive into the steps the authors suggest, there's an important component we need to consider, the socio-technical system. Having a human-centered process that uses first-hand discovery is critical to the process of blue ocean strategic thinking. This means we need to allow people to see things they've never seen before and realize the need for change themselves. This means talking to a lot of people, internally and externally, and listening over and over again. We'll refer to this as going to Gemba when we discuss lean thinking, and it's an aspect we'll cover in each of the modules throughout this course. Changing our mental model requires deliberate practice, often under the guidance of a coach. And it will also require genuine, appreciative inquiry with both existing customers and non-customers. It's important to note that Blue Ocean Shift also distinguishes between disruptive creation and non-disruptive creation. Of course, it's exciting to work on truly disruptive industry in innovations, but sometimes it is just as easy to identify and solve a brand new problem. This means creating a new market space without disrupting an existing one. The authors propose five steps to help guide you along your journey, and you'll see that these have a lot of overlap with other topics in this course, like the scientific method, Kata, PDCA, design thinking, agile, and the lean startup. Step one, get started. For this transformation project, it's critical to employ the best team possible. The best team includes the right mix of skills, level of function and hierarchy, and the appropriate character traits and strengths. Step two, understand where you are now. So you need to capture your current state. It creates a commonly owned baseline for change so you can easily agree with your team on the need for the shift. Step three, imagine where you could be. Discover the pain points of buyers imposed by the industry and widen your customer perspective by working to understand those three tiers of non-customers. Step four, find how you get there. Now you're ready to investigate systematic paths to reconstruct market boundaries. For this, we'll use the six path frameworks. You can look across alternative industries instead of just focusing on what your competitors are doing. You can also look across strategic groups within your industry. What are the strengths of the various players in your industry? Usually there's a high-end option, a cost-friendly option, and a convenient option. Is there an opportunity to combine these aspects that consumers love? Try looking across the buyer chain and redefine the industry buyer group. Normally the industry focuses on a single buyer group. So for example, the pharmaceutical industry tends to focus on physicians and influencers. Challenge these definitions and recognize that there are several buyer groups, all with different definitions of value. You could also look across complementary product and service offerings. 
should also start rethinking the functional emotional orientation of your industry. So competition in an industry tends to converge on one of two possible bases of appeal, functional utility and emotional appeal. What emotional elements can we raise or create to infuse our commodity products with new life by adding a dose of emotion? And last but not least, participate in shaping external trends over time. Most of us respond to trends in our industry at the point that we're making an impact. In other words, we're creating or using reactive strategies. All industries are subject to external trends that affect their business over time. And instead of adapting incrementally and somewhat passively, focus on which trends will change value to customers five to 10 years down the road. All right, getting back. Step five, make your move. In the last stage, the team will select a blue ocean strategy. They're going to conduct rapid market tests and iteratively refine the plan. This includes formalizing your big picture business model that delivers a win for both you and your buyers. The initiative is completed with a launch and rollout, and we'll come back to this in later modules when we're ready to focus on execution and project management. For now, I'd strongly suggest reading or listening to Blue Ocean Strategy and Blue Ocean Shift. They're packed with great examples to get your creative juices flowing.